Okay, so this is a video that should introduce uh, some of the fundamental concepts behind signals and systems. Um, the reason to introduce these fundamental concepts is that hopefully, one, it'll make better sense to you when we're done, and uh, two, it will help you understand why quite often signals and systems looks like a math class. In fact, my experience as a student and my perception of others' experiences as, as I've been teaching it is you feel like this is a very badly taught math class. But the idea is that we're going to create models of signals and systems that um, are, uh, are mathematical, and these mathematical models allow us to uh, design and analyze systems very nicely. So to begin with, we usually think abstractly, at least, of a system in sort of this way. So we think of it maybe as a box. And going into the box, we have things that we call inputs. And we draw a nice arrow to show that. Coming out of the box, we have things that you might guess we would call outputs. Okay, so the idea is um, we're going to come up with a way of representing the inputs, the system, and the outputs so that we can make some general uh, statements about generalized systems. Um, to give you a couple of examples of things that I might actually consider to be a system. Um, uh, here we'll get a bright color. So um, one thing that you might think of is cruise control. And you're all familiar with how cruise control works. The idea is that you have a car. Some of you may actually have a car and you set the speed that you want the car to go, and then the cruise control system actually has the car going that speed. So in this case, for cruise control, the idea would be that an input would be the desired speed that you want the car to go. The system is your car, and the cruise control, uh, basically anything that um, takes this desired, or that's involved in taking this desired speed, and turning it into the actual speed of the car. So in this case, the output would be the actual speed of the car. And if your cruise control is working properly, then hopefully this output is tracking the input pretty closely. And the reason why that's an achievement is this system is the car, which means that you're going down the highway at 70 miles an hour, or whatever you want to do. So that's an example. Another example might be a Segway personal transporter. And I'm sure you've seen these. And so the idea is, in, that, in this case, the system would be the Segway personal transporter. Um, the inputs, if I understand how these things work correctly, is the input would be the position of someone's body on the Segway. And by leaning forward, apparently you can make the thing move forward. By leaning backwards, you can make it back up or stop. So that would be the input. The output then would be the speed at which it's moving. Okay. And the system again would be the Segway personal transporter. Now, in addition to making everything move, one of the things the Segway does is balances on two wheels. So in that case, this is a pretty um, complicated system. Okay, another possible system, this is one that doesn't have motors and speed and stuff like that. The idea might be, uh, for example, a cell phone. And the idea behind a cell phone Actually, I'm pretty sure you're clear about that, but from a systems perspective, uh, the cell phone is actually uh, made of several subsystems. So one way to think about a subsystem, an input, would be a speech signal. And the system is the part of the cell phone that takes your speech 
and turns it into a radio signal that then gets broadcast uh, from your cell phone to a uh, cell tower and from the cell tower it goes into the phone network and uh, magically zips through the ether and that's how you can hold a conversation. So again the idea there is that the speech would be the input, the system is the part of the cell phone that turns it into bits and sends those bits over a, a transmission signal and the output would be the actual transmitted signal. Now you also have part of your cell phone where the input would be a signal that's been transmitted by a base tower and is received by your cell phone. The system is the receiver part of the cell phone and the output would be the, the sound that you hear coming out of your cell phone. So again this is the idea of inputs and outputs and uh, um, the idea in a cell phone that you actually have multiple systems involved there. Uh, the same could be said of cruise control and say you know the Segway personal transporter. There's in each of these the car has subsystems and you might characterize each subsystem. They're connected together in ways that allow you to get the overall function. So hopefully this makes sense as an idea. Um, what we do then in the study of signals and systems is we treat inputs and outputs mathematically. So an input quite often will be represented by something that looks like this, x of t, and an output will also be represented by something like this, y of t. Um, for reasons that I don't know that I've ever bothered to figure out, inputs are usually or often x, outputs are y. Um, now you'll notice that this input x is a function. You all remember from uh, algebra the definition of a function. It takes values of t and for every value of t it assigns a, n a number to it. So it's a function. We can graph it. So we might be able to say that as a function of t x might look something like this. y is also a function of t so we might be able to graph it and as a function of t which is stands for time y may look like something. Okay, But the idea is that an input is a function and an output is a function and a system mathematically takes the input function and maps it to an output function. So in some sense a system is a function of a function. It gets kind of weird and uh, we'll go through stuff like that later in much more detail. Um, now the way I've drawn this, uh, this input is a function of t where in this case t represents time. It's a continuous variable. Other types of signals can also be used. So for example I might do something like this. And this is notation that's used a lot which is also in some ways kind of confusing. So here my input signal is x of n where now n is not a continuous variable but n is an integer. So the idea here is that I might have an input signal that only has values at discrete points in time and I might have a corresponding output signal y of n and again this is a function it takes values of n and maps a particular value to it same here but it's not a function that exists over all values of time it just exists at certain discrete points in time so one way to represent x as samples xn as samples of xt would be like this. Okay, so those are the two types of uh, signals that you tend to see in a um, in a introductory signals and systems course. It doesn't always it doesn't have to be a time or, or your uh, signals don't have to be functions of time. They can also be functions of of uh, position maybe even two-dimensional position that gives you images so there's all sorts of other things they can be functions of but for uh, our purposes we'll assume they're functions of time so that concludes the introduction to signals and systems 
uh, stay tuned for more exciting videos.